Hello everybody, uh, my name is Petra Azadin and I would like to welcome Professor uh, Nicolas Dejanova here. Uh, Professor Dejanova conducted extensive ethnographic research among transnational Mexican migrant factory workers in Chicago during the 90s. His research concerned the uh, conjecture of racialization, labor subordination and the politics of immigration and the citizenship in the United States. His subsequent research concerned the politics of immigration, race, and citizenship in the United States in the aftermath of the so-called War on Terror, as well as the securitization of human mobility and the diverse experience of migrant labor and borders on a global scale. More recently, he has also become interested in the intersection of migration, racialization, border struggles, and the production of urban space in the European context. Uh, he's, uh, he published so many books, but I'm just uh, going to mention the, his new uh, edited book, The Borders of Europe, uh, Autonomy of Migration, Tactics of Bordering, uh, published uh, by Duke University Press in 2017. And uh, Professor De Genova uh, is a busy professor, busy scholar. He is currently completing three new books, two are academic monographs, one on the migrant metropolis and another on the European question, migration rates and postcoloniality. And the third, Crossing the Line, a memoir of free speech during wartime, addresses the question of political urgency for a much broader public. And personally, I'm really happy to have a professor here because I'm deeply inspired in my own work uh, with his uh, writing. So uh, I'd like to welcome you here. Thank you. So, thank you, Petra, for. Is it working? Is it working? Yes, please. Thank you, Petra, for the kind introduction. Thank you to Petra and uh, Susanna and the other organizers um, for making it possible for me to be here with you and uh, of course thank you all for coming today. Um, with no further ado, let's get started. further ado. Um, alongside a proliferation of migrant deaths in transit, <coughs> maybe before I start I will mention that some of the images I'll show are fairly graphic, um, so I'll warn anyone who might be easily disturbed. Um, alongside a proliferation of migrant deaths in transit in border zones across the planet, the European border in the Mediterranean Sea has incontestably earned the disgraceful distinction of being the veritable epicenter of such lethal border crossings. Over the last two decades, these human catastrophes at sea have indisputably transformed the maritime borders of Europe into a macabre deathscape. Untold tens of thousands of refugees, migrants, and their children have been consigned to horrific, unnatural, premature deaths by shipwreck and drowning, often following protracted ordeals of hunger, thirst, exposure, and abandonment on the high seas. The most comprehensive database Documenting migrant and refugee deaths during attempts to traverse the sea borders of Europe estimates the total number at more than 30,000 for the period since the late 1990s. Although such statistics are imperfect and the records surely involve a significant undercount, uh, that number is an average of at least four people who died 
every day for the last 20 years or so. More than 3,785 migrants were reported to have died in 2015 alone. Then mass deaths by a shipwreck began to escalate again during the spring of 2016. More than 700 people are believed to have drowned in three shipwrecks in the Mediterranean during the last week of May 2016 alone, marking the deadliest seven days for Europe's borders since uh, the notorious uh, shipwreck of, of April 2015, which can be understood to be a kind of starting point for what has come to be called the so-called crisis of migration or refugee movements in Europe. Unsurprisingly, 2016 finished yet again as the deadliest year on record with 5,143 migrant and refugee deaths recorded in the Mediterranean, an average of 14 people every day. The total number of deaths for 2017 remained alarmingly high. 3,139 lost their lives last year. European border enforcement policies and practices have actively converted the Mediterranean into a grisly mass grave. Rising numbers of border deaths in the Mediterranean Sea are no mere coincidence or accident of geography, but rather a predictable result of European immigration lawmaking, as well as a systemic feature of the routine functioning of the increasing physical fortification of the maritime border and the increasing militarization of border enforcement tactics and technologies. The perfectly predictable, deadly effects of border fortification consign migrants to disappearance and death by turning border crossing itself into a death-defying obstacle course. The systematicity of this structural violence, or what we may indeed call infrastructural violence, actively converts the sea into a geography that kills. It actively converts the sea into a geography that kills. Inasmuch as the borders of Europe have also been effectively externalized across the vast expanse of uh, the Sahara Desert, furthermore, the European border regime has created the conditions of possibility for an escalation in border zone deaths across a vast geography that precedes these perilous sea journeys. In this light, we are challenged to critically comprehend the spectacle of border policing in relation to its brute material effects. Above all, a ghastly accumulation of dead black and brown bodies. The brute racial fact of the increasingly deadly European border regime is seldom acknowledged. Because recognizing that the targets of these diverse tactics of bordering are overwhelmingly black and brown people immediately confronts us with a cruel fact of post-coloniality. Simply put, in the face of the inevitable and ever more bountiful harvest of empire, both past and present, the mobility of the vast majority of people from the formerly colonized countries, indeed the vast majority, of humanity has been preemptively illegalized. With the termination of uh, the post-World War II era guest worker programs, post-colonial labor migration from poorer countries assumed in the 1970s what was commonly the only permissible form, that of refugees fleeing persecution and seeking asylum. Predictably, the inevitable result was an ever-increasing and more aggressive outcry against allegedly bogus or fake asylum seekers. European states generally refuse to consider asylum applications that have been lodged abroad, however, and there are ordinarily no provisions in their immigration guidelines for anyone to be given permission to travel to their countries to petition for asylum. People must arrive on European soil first as so-called illegal migrants before their petition for asylum can even be considered in most cases. Moreover, travelers from all of Africa and virtually all of Asia, as well as several Latin American and Caribbean countries, require visas for travel to any Schengen Zone country 
for which the inordinate majority of prospective applicants can never qualify. Consequently, both labor migrants and refugees who cannot secure visas are compelled to first arrive on European territory as so-called unauthorized or illegal asylum seekers, and hence as de facto uh, so-called illegal migrants, who only thereafter may petition for asylum. Furthermore, the European asylum system has routinely denied the great majority of petitioners formal recognition as legitimate asylum seekers, and ordinarily grants refugee status to less than 15% of applicants. Even in the extended aftermath of the Arab Spring and ongoing civil wars in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Somalia, alongside political turmoil in Eritrea in 2012, for example, first instance refugee recognition across all EU member states was only 13.9% with 73% of all asylum applications rejected outright. As a larger complex whole, then, the European asylum system is premised upon a comprehensive suspicion of people seeking asylum and is effectively designed to disqualify as many applicants as possible as precisely, allegedly bogus refugees. Judging its real effects, therefore, the European asylum system is precisely not a system for granting asylum to refugees. In terms of its real effects and what it actually produces, the European asylum system operates as a regime for the production of migrant illegality. Thus, the European legal frameworks governing travel visas, migration, and asylum together uh, together with transportation carrier sanctions and the externalization of border policing, preclude literally the vast majority of humanity from any so-called legitimate access to the European Union, given that the horrendous risk of border crossing death systematically generated by these border regimes is disproportionately inflicted upon migrants and refugees from Europe's formerly colonized countries, that vast geography formerly known as the Third World, and now more commonly rebranded as the Global South, we should be reminded here of Ruth Gilmore's poignant proposition that this sort of unequal distribution of the prospect of violence, mutilation, and death may indeed be taken as the very definition of racism. Racism, Gilmore contends, and here I quote, is the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. State sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death." End quote. Therefore, in the face of the escalation in border deaths, we find ourselves compelled to think racially, because opposing racism requires that we notice race that we afford it the recognition it deserves and the subtlety that it embodies. Regarding the subtlety of race, it should be clear but deserves to be explicitly and emphatically affirmed that this proposition in no way upholds any anachronistic notion of race as a so-called natural, quasi-biological, pseudo-objective fact of genealogy. I'm not using race in any old-fashioned simplistic notion of uh, biological inheritance. The pernicious power of racial distinction operates precisely through the naturalization of social inequalities, constructing them as putatively natural, phenotypic, anatomical, physiological, so-called biological differences derived from common kinship and shared ancestry. But race is not a fact of nature. Race is not a fact of nature. It is a socio-political fact of domination. Indeed, race is the naturalized effect of a regime of domination orchestrated according to racialized distinctions and categories, which are themselves socio-political contrivances, socio-political inventions. Thus, race is not a fact of nature so much as a fact of racism a fact of racialized domination, configured historically and continuously reproduced on a global scale, particularly the historically specific hierarchies of social power, wealth, and prestige enforced 
through violent and oppressive regimes, historically, of European colonial white supremacy. The fervent fortification of the borders of Europe today, along with the borders of the rest of the world's richest countries, may thus be understood to be nothing less than yet another redrawing of the global color line and the post-colonial institutionalization of what Etienne Balibar has tellingly suggested may be a European apartheid. Over the last two years, we have become accustomed to ubiquitous and virtually unanimous proclamations in mass-mediated public discourse and dominant political debate regarding the so-called crisis of migration and refugee movements in Europe. In 2015, the accumulating momentum of a gathering storm of human mobility over both sea and land served to fix in place a newfound dominant common sense about the so-called migrant crisis. Then, on September 2nd, 2015, social media followed by mass news media briefly became captivated by the haunting photographs featuring the corpse of a drowned Syrian boy, soon identified as Aylan Kurdi, washed ashore in Turkey after a failed attempt to reach the Greek island of Kos left at least 12 people dead. Abruptly, the desensitizing and rather cynical rhetoric of a so-called migrant crisis began to recede in favor of appeals for compassion in the face of tragedy, accompanied by a revised, albeit ephemeral, language of so-called refugee crisis. The border spectacle of mass death in the Mediterranean in particular has intensified the contradictions of an increasingly militarized border that has had also to paradoxically shoulder the burden of a kind of minimalist humanitarianism, whereby the border patrols become implicated in rescue operations, even as every rescue, so-called, remains haunted all the same by the horizon of arrest, de detention, and deportation. The presumptive and pervasive depiction of refugees as mere migrants, has been a crucial discursive maneuver in the spectacle of Europe's border crisis. Little surprise, then, that European authorities ambivalent, uh, that the European authorities' ambivalent and belated magnanimity toward those who may ultimately be granted the status of bona fide refugees have been coupled with promises of expedited expulsion for those who may eventually be deemed to be only migrants, unwelcome, presumably irregular and undesirable, illegalized and deportable all. This has been abundantly manifest in the implementation of the so-called hotspot strategy devised by the EU in response to the escalating numbers of migrants and refugees in 2015 and implemented, implemented at several ports uh, in Italy and the Greek islands, the most prominent of which are Lampedusa and Lesbos. The hotspots, as they're called, were proposed as emergency reception centers with the capacity to provide shelter for as many as 1,500 people at key ports of first arrival on EU territory for the purpose of speedy identification, registration, and fingerprinting. In practice, the hotspots operate as detention camps dedicated to the perfunctory and crass sorting and ranking between those deemed to be likely to have a credible asylum petition who are then to be redistributed to other EU countries and everyone else, who served a deportation order as quickly as possible. Of course, those who refuse to be fingerprinted are frequently subjected to physical coercion, and others are simply subjected to indefinite detention in the closed prison sections of the hotspot camps. Moreover, the identification of those presumed to be likely to have a credible asylum claim has often been reserved for those from countries with a higher than 75% asylum acceptance rate, namely Syria, Iraq, and Eritrea. Thus, a crude national origins selection process is what has been implemented in practice. Again, in callous disregard for even a rudimentary consideration of any of the claims of the majority of those arriving. When the hotspot began operation in Lampedusa, for instance, newly arrived refugees and migrants were asked to fill out a multiple choice questionnaire in Italian, indicating their reason for coming to Italy. They were allowed to respond, A, to work, B, 
to escape misery, C, for family reunification, or D, for other reasons. Because most were unable to read and understand the form, the forms were commonly completed by Italian border police. The nondescript, none of the above option was literally the only occasion whereby they could indicate a desire to apply for asylum. The great majority were consequently rejected the same day and received what was officially called a deferred refoulement decree, better known as a seven days decree, which obliged them to deliver themselves to Rome's Fiumicino airport within seven days and leave the country at their own expense. Commonly, they were in fact transported by Italian police to the railway station of Agrigento in Sicily and abandoned without any money or even instructions about where to go. At the height of the migrant or refugee crisis, these hotspot deportation orders therefore ensured that the vast majority of newly arrived asylum seekers were preemptively rejected in flagrant disregard for the integrity of any customary asylum procedure and were effectively, almost instantly, converted into illegalized migrants who were precisely not deported, but would remain deportable and were left to their own devices. Thus the hotspot system is plainly a machine for the extradited legal production of migrant illegality. Thus there's a profound continuity between ever-rising border body counts and the disposability of life at the borders of Europe with the deportability of illegalized migrants and refugees. The vicious severities of Europe's extended and expansive border zones presents a fierce endurance test, a preliminary apprenticeship in what promises for most to be a more or less protracted career of migrant illegality. Precarious labor, arduous exploitation, and deportability. Nonetheless, migrants' needs, desires, and aspirations always supersede this death-defying obstacle course, albeit at times at the cost of their lives. Migrants' needs, desires, and aspirations always supersede this death-defying obstacle course, even when they have to die trying to get across. The militarization and ostensible fortification of borders, as a result, proved to be much more reliable for enacting a strategy of capture than for functioning as mere technologies of exclusion. Once migrants have successfully navigated their ways across such borders, the onerous risks and costs of departing and later attempting to cross yet again become inordinately prohibitive. It is virtually unthinkable for anyone who's made this crossing to contemplate leaving and crossing again. And so it, the militarization of the borders present a kind of spectacle of exclusion but also functions as a strategy of capture. Rather than keeping illegalized migrants out, the militarization of the border simply tends to trap the great majority of those who succeed to get across, now caught indefinitely inside the space of Europe as a very prized kind of highly vulnerable migrant labor. The ceaseless fortification of the borders of Europe presents the epitome of what I've depicted as a spectacle of exclusion that mystifies its own obscene secret, the permanent, subordinate inclusion of illegalized, non-European, non-white migration. Such gruesome and deadly spectacles of border enforcement conceal the fact that even those migratory movements, which are officially prohibited, branded as illegal, and supposed to be absolutely unwanted and rejected, are in fact, objectively speaking, to various extents, welcomed by prospective employers as, high, as a highly prized variety of labor power. Thus, the increasing fortification of Europe's borders in a grand and ever increasingly deadly performance of exclusion is permanently accompanied, nonetheless, by a kind of subordinate inclusion, the ever-expanding fact of illegalized migration. Consequently, the brute fact 
is that some border crossers die while many others survive and prevail in their illegalized migratory projects. In a de facto process of artificial selection, these deadly obstacle courses serve to sort, to sort out the most able-bodied, disproportionately favoring the younger, stronger, and healthier among prospective labor migrants, and likewise inordinately favoring men over women. Thus, the outright disposability of migrant lives, so routinely, so routinely verified by the deadly borders of Europe, cannot be seen as a purely necro-political phenomenon. Bordering, uh, border policing has plainly become cruel, indeed lethal, murderous, but it is not about cruelty, pure and simple, and not exclusively about producing the conditions of possibility for mass death. The blunt truth is that some migrants must die, which is to say some are made to die, indeed some are killed outright, but, but many more are made to die. Uh, but while some migrants must die, most survive as illegalized migrants who may proceed from this deadly endurance test to continue their lifelong careers as precarious, disposable, ever-deportable workers. The largely anonymous black and brown bodies that populate Europe's border zones as often unidentified and unidentifiable corpses must therefore be apprehensible as specifically non-European, non-white migrant lives. We are confronted therefore not only with a border that produces migrant and refugee deaths, but one that contributes systematically to the production of non-white lives as disposable. The deadly border does not only kill, but also plays a productive role. Its power is productive, crucial for the continuous production and reproduction of migrant lives as disposable, deportable labor power. Hence, we begin to see not only the cruel extremities of European border control as a regulatory regime, but also the regularities that it truly produces. Foremost among them, the very so-called irregularity, the so-called illegality of so-called illegal migrants. If we're prepared to contemplate the significance of these migrant and refugee lives, however, why does it remain so difficult in Europe to acknowledge the blunt racial materiality of these lives? With the European coastlines littered with dead black and brown bodies, in light of the racial materiality of the unrelenting conversion of European borders into a ghoulish deathscape, it is little surprise that one mode of critical response has been to invoke an analogy with the premier slogan of contemporary African-American civil rights struggles in the United States, Black Lives Matter, by insisting in the European context that migrant lives matter. Of course, it is an outrageous fact that the proposition that black lives matter remains controversial in the United States. And analogously, objective realities command that we admit that the proposition that migrant lives matter remains fundamentally in dispute in Europe. As I've been hoping to demonstrate, a European border regime that systematically generates and multiplies the conditions of possibility for mass migrant deaths compels us to reckon with the brute fact that the lives of migrants and refugees required to arrive on European soil by so-called irregular, illegalized means have been systematically exposed to lethal risks. But if migrant lives do arguably matter in Europe, why is it so persistently and perniciously difficult to recognize them as black and brown lives? Why and how exactly? Has Europe so deftly managed to convert the precarious lives and bodies of migrants and refugees, disproportionately racialized as non-white, into overtly deracialized so-called migrant lives? And if objective circumstances conspire to ensure that these lives truly do not matter, that these migrant lives are rendered utterly disposable, does it not seem plausible, if not probable, that race has something to do with it? These linkages have long been made in the struggles of people of color across Europe. Those who are so commonly and casually depicted as migrant 
or still more revealingly, those who are perennially euphemized as being, quote unquote, of migrant background. These linkages have also been made, although perhaps less consistently, by many of the allied anti-racist solidarity movements. We've witnessed, for instance, the emergence in Britain of a fledgling uh, but spirited Black Lives Matter movement explicitly dedicated to an anti-racist internationalist solidarity with the struggles against racist police brutality and murder in the United States, as well as elaborating a global analysis that links systemic racial oppression in the United States with racist policing and state violence in Britain. Still more pertinent for present purposes are efforts by the, British, by the same British movement to directly define anti-racist struggles in Britain as involving not only racism and racist police brutality against black British citizens, but also several wider questions concerning the politics of migration. Mass migrant deaths during perilous, the, the perilous crossing of the Mediterranean, abuses perpetrated during migrant detention, incarceration, and deportation, state-sanctioned Islamophobia, through putative anti-terrorist programs, and the escalation of anti-immigrant hate crimes. All of these are explicit as concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement in Britain. Making, marking the fifth anniversary of the London police murder on the 4th of August 2011 of an unarmed black British man, Mark Duggan, which prompted riots across Greater London and numerous other English cities, the Black Lives Matter movement staged protests on the 5th of August 2016 in London, Birmingham, Manchester, and Nottingham. Notably, access roads to London Heathrow and Birmingham airports were specifically targeted for civil disobedience because, their, because of their association with the detention and deportation of migrants, including the death under restraint of Angolan uh, deportee Jimmy Mubenga in October 2010. A similarly salutary <coughs> development directly inspired by the struggles in the United States is evidenced by the emergence of Berlin's Ferguson is Everywhere campaign to denounce the killing of people of color by German police and indeed across Europe. Inevitably, these initiatives, which unmistakably have been energized by the Black Lives Matter struggles in the United States, build nonetheless upon more long-standing anti-racist struggles in Europe, such as the London-based campaign against police police and state violence, Berlin's European network of peoples of African descent, Amsterdam's new urban collective, and the Parti des Ambigeants de la République in France, the PIR. What is vital here, however, is to recognize that these analogies and connections remain emphatically racial in their political self-understanding and critical analyses. Thus, there is increasingly a linkage between the mass deaths of non-European, non-white migrants and refugees systematically generated by the European border regime and the systemic racism of police abuses and killings perpetrated against people of color in so-called migrant neighborhoods. These examples do not exhaust what is at stake in the present historical moment, however, which I characterize as one of European racial crisis. We've witnessed a remarkable conjuncture between the acceleration and diversification of migrant and refugee mobilities on the one hand and the mutually constitutive crises of European borders and European identity on the other. This means that the very politics of Europeanness, what it even means to ask who is a European, what is Europe, the very politics of Europeanness have become a flashpoint for reanimated reactionary populist nationalisms and racialized nativisms, the routinization of anti-terrorist securitization, and pervasive and entrenched Islamophobia, or more precisely, anti-Muslim racism. While a more generic derision toward migrants or refugees advances one variety of specifically anti-Muslim racism, however, the very category Muslim also tends to be conflated with a whole racialized class constellation. Hence, Uria Butelcha, spokesperson, of the, spokesperson for the Parti des Ambigeants de la République, the peer in France, unpacks the contemporary Muslim question in France and by implication in Europe more generically um, as follows. Here I quote, I would even say, this is uh, Butelcha speaking, 
Uh, I would even say that Muslim also denotes resident of a poor neighborhood. It is sometimes a euphemism for banlieue. Its meaning is pejorative. In France, Islam is above all a religion of the poor and of immigrants, and therefore of a part of the population that has no political, economic, or media power. While white European identity, that the white European, the, the white European identity that dominated the world for 500 years is in decline. The voices, often hysterical, raised in the media against Islam, fundamentally express a fear of this decline. Whites are losing their historical centrality. And they see all these non-whites, wrongly identified with Islam, as a threat to their identity." End quote. Thus, as a category, Muslim commonly condenses both racial and class derision, encompassing non-white so-called foreigners, or indeed persons, quote unquote, of migrant background, who may not even be Muslims. Thus, regarding the perceived crisis of European prestige and prosperity, there is a persistent conflation of migration, race, and Muslim identity as relatively floating signifiers for the intrinsically contradictory mediation of the contemporary protracted post-colonial condition. Predominantly native-born citizens of France, so-called second or third generation youth of color, the Parti des Indigens de la, de la République, the peer, proclaimed themselves to be indigène, indigenous, a term of French colonial provenance referring to colonized subjects, indeed the colonized natives. Compelled to, as they put it, live the experience of colonial racism within France, despite ostensible citizenship, they provocatively refuse to play the game of assimilation and claim their putative rights as citizens, and instead declare themselves to be the republic's colonized natives. Indeed, they repudiate the treacherous egalitarian promise of citizenship itself, denounce their post-colonial racial subjugation, and call for the decolonization of the French Republic. The peer thus announces the political coming of age of French-born youth of color, who boldly claim their own post-colonial entitlement to define the future of France. In the European context more generally, the very figure of migration is always already racialized. And anti-racist struggles are inevitably concerned, at least in part, with the racial condition of non-European migrants. Yet dominant discourses of migration in Europe stubbornly and systematically evade any frank confrontation and engagement with race as such. The European intellectual and political context more generally remains exemplary in David Theo Goldberg's words of what happens when no category is available to name a set of experiences that are linked to racial arrangements and engagements. That Europe presents a case study in the frustrations, delimitations, and injustices of political racelessness. This is what Goldberg has tellingly designated to be racial Europeanism specifically referring to the presumptive elision of the analytical concept of race with the essentialist conceits of racism and the pervasive reduction of any question of racism in European context to the historical experience of the Nazi Holocaust, Goldberg demonstrates how Europe's colonial history and legacy dissipate, if not disappear. Sanctimonious desires to renounce race as a residually racist article of faith in other words, supply the dubious pretexts for an astounding post-colonial historical amnesia. Moreover, we're frequently left with the peculiarly European paradox of an anti-racism without race, which is to say an anemic anti-racism that reverts to the purest liberalism, a mere politics of anti-discrimination, which is, uh, which in its refusal to interrogate the socio-political production of racialized distinctions, restabilizes the notion that racism is little more than a discriminatory hostility toward phenotypic and anatomical differences, and thus renaturalizes race as biology. Banishing race as a critical analytical category, in other words, risks forsaking any adequate account of the distinctly European colonial legacies that literally produce race as a sociopolitical category of distinction and discrimination in the first place. 
Although race is systematically dissimulated, if not actively disavowed in many European contexts, therefore, we are compelled by circumstances to think racially, to confront the accumulating realities of new or reanimated racial formations of European whiteness, as well as newly mobilized struggles for racial justice among those who are racially subjugated as non-white, non-European, migrant, refugee, or indeed of migrant background. And indeed, the racially saturated but ostensibly race-neutral figures of migrants, migration, are central to these new European formations of race and racism, arising from the contradictions between the subjective projects of migrant or refugee non-Europeans exercising their elementary freedom of movement on the one hand, and state authorities' efforts to manage the migrants and refugees' subordinate inclusion on the other, the sheer magnitude and momentum of migrant and refugee mo movements has meant that the socio-political space of Europe has been convulsed by a post-colonial racial crisis. And on that note, I'll stop.